Next, I want to tell you about the strong law of large numbers. The strong law of large numbers is a difficult, complicated theorem, but in fact the proofs we have built up so far are so strong that in a few lines I'm going to be able to, to prove it to you. So everybody knows what the strong law of large numbers is. Let x n be i i d in L1 on a probability space. Define s n as the sum of the first n of them. Okay, then s n over n converges to the mean mu of these, of, of the x i's, in L1 and also almost surely. So here mu is defined to be the expectation of the x i's. It's all the same because they are ID. Okay, let's prove this with what we have so far. So I'm going to start with defining uh, this kind of decreasing system of sigma algebras. And instead of looking into the past, there is no really, there is not really a past here because we're looking at the forward sequence of the accents. But I'm still going to do something very funny here. I'm going to define g of minus n as the sigma algebra generated by the sums starting from n. And this is for every n positive or non-negative, well, positive. Okay, so these are the Sns, the sums uh, up to n, and generate by Sn, Sn plus 1, Sn plus 2, and so on, and so on, the sigma algebra g minus n. Now, it's clear that this has this kind of decreasing property. So g minus n is a subset of g of minus n plus 1, which you could also say as g of minus of n minus 1. So that's why I say it's a decreasing property. And also define, as before for the Danvers theorem, g minus infinity as the intersection of these people. So intersection of g minus n. Okay, so once we have these definitions, then let's do a few simple observations. The first observation I want to make is that the sigma algebra generated by Sn and all the subsequent, subsequent S, uh, n plus 1, Sn plus 2, and so on, you can also think about that, or you can also just say that this is the sigma algebra generated by actually two sigma algebras, one generated by Sn itself and one generated by the rest. And by the rest, I really mean, so if you know Sn, well, how do you get to Sn plus 1 or Sn plus 2 and so on and so on? You just need to know the axes. So if you know Sn, you need to know Xn plus 1, Xn plus 2 and so on to get to all the further axes. So in fact, I think about the sigma algebra generated by the Sn, Sn plus 1, Sn plus 2 and so on as the sigma algebra generated by Sn and then looking at all the further iid axes from there. Okay? And this will be important in a second, because now I want to find out the expectation of x1 given g of minus n. This is going to be the key quantity we want to look at. Okay, so what is this? So the claim is that it's enough to look at the sigma algebra of Sn, and I don't need to look anything further in g minus n. So g minus n is generated by Sn and the rest of the axis. Suppose I want to say anything about x1, and suppose that somebody tells me Sn, Sn is given, I want to find out anything about x1, do I need to know anything about the further axis? And the answer is no. If Sn is given, that's all the information I need to find out this conditional expectation of x1 given g minus n, because fixing Sn, whatever the further axis do, is completely independent of uh, both Sn and my x1. So there is a good amount of independence here. Okay, so this part here is independent of actually the joint distribution of x1 and Sn, or if you want the sigma algebra generated by them. 
So if I want to find out the expectation given Sn, I don't need to know the further axis. Okay? It doesn't matter if I add this part of the sigma algebra in here or if I don't, it doesn't make any difference in the distribution of x1 given Sn. Okay, so that's the first observation. The second observation is that this is actually, you could also write this as expectation of x1 given Sn. Remember, this is how we define condition expectation given a random variable. And in fact, this is a nice homework problem in probability 1. So I'm not going to solve it here, that this thing is exactly Sn over n. So I'm not writing and solving this, but if you want to prove this, you just do a sum here and just do some symmetry considerations, and uh, that's how you get that. Okay, so now this is very nice, and now we look at Levy's downward theorem. Levy's downward theorem. which exactly said that these kind of objects are martingales and that they converge to somewhere, to an m-infinity, almost surely and in L1. So this thing, E of any random variable, which now happens to be G, uh, X1. But in the David Dunworth theorem it was just any random variable gamma. I happened to look at X1. Uh, this will converge, and notice that it's still equal to Sn over n, this will converge to some limit. I'm going to call this uh, limit L as n goes to infinity. I could as well call this n infinity. Uh, you have this limit almost surely, okay? So that's davis Dunworth theorem. Okay, now... There is this almost sure limit of the Sn over n, and as usual, um, I can get rid of the almost sure problems, because Sn over n might not converge with zero probability, so L might not be well defined with zero probability, but L is always defined if I define it as actually, instead of the limit, I'm, I'm actually slightly modifying my definition, and I'm going to say it's the limb soup, which always exists, and then this definition is... Uh, almost sure the limit of the Sn over n. Okay, so I'm going to actually put this in parentheses. I'm going to say that this thing converges almost surely, and if I define L as the limb soup, then this limit almost surely exists and is equal to L. Okay, now, here comes the thing. What is this limb soup and what can I uh, say about this limb soup? So, I'm going to look at a K. So, I'm going to fix K and for large enough k, for large enough k, I can write Sn as, um, I'm going to do this, x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 plus xk, and then proceed from k plus 1 to Sn. This is true whenever n is larger than k over n. And here is the important message I want to now get through, is that if I look at this bunch of the sum from x1 to xk, and I swap them over to something completely different, I replace all of these people with some other axes. In the limb soup, it will not make any difference whatsoever. Because in the limb soup, if I divide this green branch with, with, with n, that will just go to zero, and the rest will completely determine my limb soup. So this limb soup here is not dependent on x1 through xk. If I completely replace x1 through xk, nothing changes. Okay? So this thing does not change, does not change uh, with x1 through xk. If I replace x1 through xk, the limb soup will not notice that. That means that was the, exactly the definition of this uh, tail sigma algebra star k. So that means that L is tau k measurable. This was the tail sigma algebra. So remember, tau k was the sigma algebra generated by xk plus 1, xk plus 2, and so on and so on. And, uh, sorry, I noticed that this should be Xn at the end here. Okay, so 
at least tau k measurable. And now this is true for every k. This is true for every k, all right? Which means that it's a uh, intersection of tau k measurable. In other words, this thing is also tau measurable. Remember, tau was the intersection of the tau k's. And this was the tail sigma algebra. This was the tail sigma algebra. So this thing is tau measurable. Okay? This slim soup of SN over N, L, is tau measurable, is tail measurable. Now comes Kolmogorov 0, 1, low. The tail sigma algebra is generated from IID random variables. The X signs are IID. So now comes Kolmogorov's 0, 1, low, which says that tau is trivial. Tau is trivial. Any event in tau is 0 or 1 probability. So it follows that if I ask about the probability that L, this random variable, is a constant C, C is a non-random constant, this probability must be 0 or 1. This thing is 0 or 1. It must be 1 for some, rand for some value of C, right? Because I have L, the random variable, it can't be 0 everywhere. So it must be 1 for some value of C. So it follows that P of L equals C is 1 for some C. But what can that C be? Well, the expectation of L is, of course, uh, mu because of the L1 convergence. And the expectation of Sn over N, let me write this out in a different color, the expectation of Sn over N is, for every fixed N, is this mean mu of the IID random variables. So the expectation of L must also be U, so it follows from here and there. Uh, because we, we also have L1 convergence here, right? So it's not only all, almost sure, it's also L1 convergence. It follows that the expectation of L must be also mu. Okay? So what can that constant C be if the expectation needs to be mu? C can only be mu. So the probability L equals to mu must be 1 and not something else. And for all other Cs, it's 0. Oops. Okay, so, so the end of the story is that this constant must be mu because of the mean of L. There is no other choice that probability L equals to mu is 1. In other words, we prove the theorem. So Sn over n uh, is the almost sure, uh, L is the almost sure limit of Fn o Sn over n, and it must be mu with probability 1. That's the end of the story.